fire all of their stuff. <laughs> like the guy who did it. Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Chaitanya. And like the two track compiler that we saw a few minutes ago, uh, this talk is also going to be about a program, a compiler which focuses on program optimization. But instead of using parallelization to achieve that, we sort of focus on data representation uh, to achieve speed up. So why is data representation important anyways? Uh, because uh, inefficient representations can really make your program slow. So consider this three data type. Uh, the one on the left is written in Haskell, and this one is C, but they, are, they essentially mean the same thing. Uh, the way that most compilers would represent this in memory is something like this by something like this. So every node is a separate heap object, and they're sort of connected together with pointers. Now, I don't mean to claim that this representation is always inefficient. Uh, there are some good properties about it. Uh, it has a nice inductive structure and uh, it's easy to use in programs. But when we want to traverse this whole thing, uh, these pointers are really going to make pro our programs slow. Uh, the processors cannot uh, efficiently optimize pointer chasing programs like these. So what is, uh, so also external data is uh, a challenge with programs like this. Uh, so we typically store data on our disk uh, in serialized formats. Uh, and before we can use them in our programs, there's usually a parsing step involved. Uh, and as your data sets grow bigger, uh, this can quickly become a bottleneck. Uh, something similar comes up when you have to send things over network. There is a deserialization and corresponding serialization step involved at either end. And this can be inefficient for larger data sets. So what if we could use the same external representation that we store on disks and write our programs in a way that use the external representation directly? That would be uh, really great for us to do. But there are some trade-offs involved with it. So you typically want to treat these representations as cache versions of your data. You typically don't <coughs> want to store them on disk uh, and don't want to treat them as persistent storage. Uh, this also affects portability. So your programs are sort of tied together with a particular representation. But when you can uh, write programs like these, uh, you get huge performance benefits. Uh, so there are libraries which allow you to do this. Uh, GHC 8.2 introduced something called compact normal forms, in which you can mark a data type as being compact, and the compiler <coughs> ensures that every member, every value of that particular type is in a one compact region, and it's not garbage collected, and you can just send that over the network or store that on disk. Capital Proto is another project which goes a bit further in this direction. So in Capital Proto, you can serialize your JSON data to their format, which they call Protos, and you can directly write programs uh, which use that representation. So this is great, uh, but we want to go even further in this direction. Uh, we want to have a compiler which sort of changes the underlying representation completely out from under the programmer without the programmer having to do much uh, about it. Uh, so that's what we do. Uh, our goal in this talk is going to be uh, to optimize programs using an efficient representation. So what is the representation that we use? Uh, so if you have a tree data type like this, uh, instead of representing it with pointers, we use a pre-order serialization <coughs> where the nodes and leaves are sort of stored in one compact buffer. Uh, this is not up uh, the correct size because the n and the l's in this image are actually just one byte tags and we represent them as such. So the ones come from nodes and the zeros are leaves and you store your data like this. So we do not mean to claim that this representation is a new idea. Uh, I've been told that 
uh, in array programming languages, people have been using this for a long time. Uh, what we, what is new, however, is that our compiler transforms your programs automatically to operate on these buffers. So a programmer can keep writing simple uh, high-level functions and still get the benefits of this representation. So this is uh, what it's going to. Uh, I'm going to go over how we, how does the compiler do this. So uh, before we look at that, let's look at an example of what programs uh, operating on these buffers look like. So this is a simple add one function. Uh, this is going to be the running example for most of the talk. Uh, what this does is it would iterate through this tree and bump all of the ends by one. Uh, so when you write programs that operate on those serialized buffers, it sort of looks like this. And the first thing you notice about this is it's really long compared to the other version, which is one reason uh, that we don't want programmers to write these sorts of programs by hand. Uh, this is a simple function operating on a relatively simple data type, but as your programs go bigger, uh, these things are difficult to write and difficult to maintain. So we'll sort of walk through this and see what it's doing. Uh, so notice that there are, instead of just taking one tree and returning one tree, it's sort of taking these two pointers, and they're suggestively named in and out, because one is an input pointer, one is a pointer to the input tree, and the other is a pointer to the output tree. And this is sort of using a variant of destination passing style, where programs which want to write something to memory do not allocate anything, but the caller of this function would allocate the block of memory for them, and they just use that. So when we start running this function, this is what it's going to look like. The input pointer is pointing to the same tree uh, which we had before, and the output pointer is going to point to a, an empty block of memory right now. And we want to write the output tree to that thing. So the first thing we do is see if the input thing was a leaf. In this case, it was not. It's a node. So we come down here. We immediately start writing the node tag. We sort of write the one here. And what we want to do is recursively process the left subtree now. And to do that, we bump both of these pointers so that the input pointer points to the left subtree and the output pointer points to the right memory location. Uh, we recursively call add one. We come up here again. Uh, it's a leaf, so we read that tag. Uh, we move the pointer ahead so that it's on the end that we want to process. We read that in uh, its 10. So a bunch of other memory operations. And we write the leaf tag here. And we write the bump to version of the number that we wanted. So these are the sort of programs that our compiler would generate automatically from the simple ones like these. So that's the basic idea. Uh, now why is this good? Why are programs like these good? So this is an evaluation with some, some of the other languages. Uh, the C version, which would use pointers uh, in, in its backend, is over here. Uh, these are some other languages which do the same thing. And you can kind of see that they're all in the same bucket because they're doing the same thing. They're all using pointer-based representations. And the pack version is down here. It's way faster than everything else. So I hope that this motivates uh, that there is a good reason for us to write programs like this. Uh, so the reason that this is fast is uh, the, in the example that we saw, uh, we had blocks of memory which were all packed closely together, and we were only using them using those cursors. So which gives rise to linear memory access patterns, which the processors are very efficient at optimizing, uh, which gives us very fast programs. So this is the sort of speed up that we get. We are three times faster than regular C programs, and with to some of the other libraries. Yep. So you. Are you relying on hardware that can do online memory accesses efficiently? Uh, yeah. So we are. Which is 
Not all hardware does that. Not all, not all hardware does that, but most of the modern processors are optimized to do things like this. Is what? Yeah. You, well, I was going to ask when you say most modern processors, what what so, things do you have in mind? So all of these benchmarks are uh, running on regular Intel processors. We have not used any special processors or any special hardware to run these. Just ARM and MIPS and lots of other architectures don't. It's regular x86 processors. Right. Okay. Well, yeah. So you're restricted to tree-based output structures. So, so regular programs that will graphs and they copy pointers from the input part of the stack to the output. There's no copy. So we. I am using three as a, an example here, but we can efficiently encode graphs and other sorts of programs, and we'll see how we do that. Nothing. Yeah. So it, it doesn't seem like it really depend on, on being able to access to the one of our access web performance. If we just had the bytes to words, and you will still have a linear memory access patterns and all the stuff that actually gets you the performance. You just use it in more space. So that is correct. We are so. When I said I rely on unaligned memory access patterns, I did not mean that. But we are not doing anything specific to align those bytes in memory. Any more questions? Uh, so, uh, as you might be wondering, uh, updates on these sorts of representations are tricky to encode. Uh, so using a pointer-based representation, it's really easy to update this tree. So if you want to update this, uh, this to be 40 instead, you would just allocate a new node and update the pointer. Uh, and that's it. You have, you have updated the tree. Uh, to do this on these kinds of representations, uh, it's kind of difficult to do this, because you sort of want to update this small chunk of the buffer. But you can't directly do that because you have no way of knowing uh, what arbitrary new information you may want to write there. So these things are tricky to do. Uh, one way to compile these would be to just copy everything again. Uh, you start by writing the node tag. You write the new subtree that you wanted to update. And you copy the right subtree again. But uh, this, you basically changed the asymptotic complexity of your function, and you have basically copied the whole tree again just to update one node. And this is inefficient. So the way we fix this is by using pointers. So you might complain that I started my talk by saying that pointers are bad, and you shouldn't use them. <laughs> but when, when you use a limited way like this, you sort of get the best of both worlds. You can get the performance benefits of using serialized data types and you can use pointers in some of the corner cases to maintain the asymptotic complexity. So what we do is uh, we call these pointers indirections. So if you wanted to update this tree, uh, you would write a node tag. You would write whatever new tree you wanted. And we use a special tag here called i, which stands for indirection, which sort of lets the program know that uh, the next thing in the stream is going to be a pointer, and you should follow that. And this is how you would update the stream. But that, but that means you copy, if you were to say update the last leaf, uh -huh. you have to copy the whole prefix of the array. So, no, you would only potentially copy the spine of the tree. Uh, if you wanted, so if, if this thing was in the right subtree, you would have a pointer to the left subtree of the main thing. And you would, that depends on where the element you want to update. Is. Uh, another thing that's tricky with this is out of order traversals. Uh, so by encoding these things in a buffer, we have essentially committed to a traversal order, which is pre-order in this case. And as long as you write programs which sort of process the stream in this way, you're fine. But uh, if you write programs like a rightmost function, which sort of skips over the left subtree completely and accesses the right one, these sorts of programs are also tricky to compile. Uh, one way to, so the challenge here is that you will have your cursor here, and you want to skip <coughs> over this whole tree to get to the right subtree. But there is no way to statically know how many bytes should the cursor skip. Uh, 
in sort of runtime information. Uh, what we need here is some way to skip over this, and one really nice way to do this is we say that forever is the thing anyways, even if you don't care about it, just so that the cursor ends up in the right place. But then again, you have changed the asymptotic complexity of the function. So we fix this again by using pointers. Uh, but only enough that allow random access to that subtrees. So you would update your data type to do something like this. So this is a pointer which would point to the right subtree because you can statically access this one. And that's how you access it. So the buffer would look something like this. Uh, you have a node tag. You have a pointer which, are, which points to the right subtree. And this would be done across the whole thing. It's not like the interaction that we saw earlier. Uh, you sort of do this for the whole data type or not at all. Now, we in the benchmarks, we will see that uh, doing this is not so inefficient, and we can still get the benefits of be, uh, the other data being mostly back. So, so why find this not just names? Uh, what, what do you mean by so instead of storing, oh, the next tree is an address, whatever, mm -hmm. so uh, the next the, the, the next tree is uh, n bytes in length, so you want to one after that, just make the way n That is a good point, and we didn't consider doing that, but we sort of stuck to this because we were using uh, direct pointers in the in directions thing, but that is one thing that uh, we wanted to change about this, yeah, uh, so that stores size information, essentially. So the reason I'm asking is that, uh, with your original uh, pack representation, mm -hmm. that, uh, that entire tree was one object with average collector. Yeah. It was very cheap. But now that average has to go in and look for all these pointers and fix them. So uh, this is not true for this case, because these pointers would always point into the same region. Yeah, but if you move the, the sort of total offset of the location of the entire object, uh -huh. are they, they are relative pointers? They are not relative, but they, are all, they would always point within the same region. Most garbage, the, most garbage collectors have an optimization that says if an object doesn't contain any pointers, it doesn't need to be scanned. Uh -huh. So if you just had offset numbers in there, you, you would never need to scan the object at all because so it wouldn't this, contain so any this pointers. Is, that's a good point in general, but we're, we don't use garbage collection, we do region inference. Right, okay. That's even better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that should have been the... So these pointers are also, also going to other buffers when you uh, do the sharing of code. That is, so we need garbage collection for that, uh, and we have a very simple uh, garbage collection implement, uh, uh, implementation which uses reference counting. But this is just in general not a problem for garbage collection. Uh, so I may get to this, uh, but if you go back to this question about entity, you make the modification of the tree. So a very common uh, pattern is going to be walking over the tree, sometimes making Edits, yeah. Sometimes not making edits. Yeah. And I wonder if what you end up with at the end is going to be just something that's just going to be all over the place. So, or do you have a more efficient way of dealing with that pattern? So, if we we can have heuristics in the compiler which basically say that if you update a tree a thousand times, just copy it one time so that you end up with a good back representation. Or you can have a hack which says that. After an update, just map over the tree so that the result is uh, a packed structure again, and you won't end up with a fragmented tree. Yeah, I mean, for example, consider a tree representation of a program, mm -hmm. right? And you're doing something like uh, you know, code generation, right? Or in yeah. some places you're pruning some subtrees, and yeah. other places you're, you're not. Uh -huh. So that, I mean, that traversal is just left right traversal, you could just do it as a straight copy, build a new, you know, new thing as you go along, and yeah. it would all be linear in the end. But you, but you have to sort of analyze the code to do that. Yes. Uh, yeah, so this is, so if you, if you have those kinds of programs, uh, this would not uh, work very well. But if you just want to traverse it, uh, these pointers uh, are not that bad for Yeah, I wasn't part. so much worried about I was actually thinking about the earlier slide, there about the editing, you know, uh -huh. the update part. Okay. Not uh, worried about the pointer part, but just the update part. Oh. That this one? Part. Oh, yeah, that part. This one? Yeah. So, yeah, even these pointers, uh, if you do this a lot of times, you're going to end up with a fragmented data, data set. 
but there are ways to fix this. So you can say that if you do this enough times, I map over it once so that the result is in one single buffer again. Or the compiler can automatically do this after some number of inserts. It seems these pointers they have there are always immutable references, right? Uh -huh. the, Is that correct? I mean, the semantically, they're immutable in the sense that the, these are immutable data structures. Use them for sharing. Yeah. And only share. Yes. yes. Yeah. They don't change. We don't update yes. anything in place. These are all always new copies of uh, this one. Yeah. So I apologize if I missed something, but how does this interact with laziness? Do you have, uh, it looks like you haven't made this, this strict data structure, at least in the past, the same as. Uh -huh. So if you have like an infinite left hand tree, what do you do with it? So the, the easy thing to ask syntax, but this is a call. Right? Yeah, this is it's a, it's a call that I Okay, sorry. This is not implemented in GHC. Uh, yeah. This is really using the Haskell syntax. Sorry, this is not in GHC. Uh, any more questions? Okay. Uh, so we have so the last, this is something we'll look at. We have actually formalized a location calculus, which we use to sort of do all of these transformations and compile the programs. Uh, so this is what the compiler looks like. Uh, the way you should read this is we have three different IRs. The source is the one that the program is used to write programs. The target is the one that we just saw. Uh, and this full load thing is the location calculus that we'll look at. And these compiler passes in one box run one after the other. And these arrows sort of connect those two different IRs. Uh, so let's look at what the source language for this looks like. So this is a first order strategy type language, which has support for algebraic data types. And this is a small language, but it has a front end for Haskell and bracket like syntax. So the programs that we've been already looking at are already valid source programs. We can compile them. Uh, and native types, like we have some primitive types, uh, like ints and boots, which are just written as it is. But every other user-defined data type is packed by default. And the pro compiler would translate all of these to uh, work on buffers. And they would be in the buffers. So I'm going to stop a few minutes uh, on this location calculus. So we, have, we designed this to make the transition between the source and target programs easier. And we have formalized this, or we can prove some properties about it. So this is based on the region calculus, which was first implemented in MLKit. So in a region calculus, uh, all values are annotated uh, to live in specific regions, and this is done at compile time. Uh, so we do something similar, but in addition to doing that, we sort of want to know what order does data live in a specific region. So for our tree data type, we want to know that the left subtree would be serialized before the right subtree and so on. So we're going to look at an example, uh, add one again. Uh, this is what add one looks like in core look. Uh, so we have every type is annotated with these locations and region. So this thing means that uh, add one accepts a tree at location L in, in region R1 and returns a new tree at location L out in region R2. Uh, so this is what it looks like. It's very similar to the cursor passing code that we saw earlier. Uh, every values uh, in the pattern match are also annotated with these types. So this would mean that the left subtree is at location L A and the L B is at location L B. And you can sort of do sort of like uh, a limited version of pointer arithmetic with it. Uh, you can say uh, a location is at some offset from other location, and things like that. <coughs> so I, I probably won't have time to go into this, uh, but this is what the grammar looks like. Uh, we can create new regions using this let region form. And a region in this case are the buffers that we were looking at. So this is going to allocate a new block of memory. Uh, you can create locations that reference into those regions. So 
So a location could be a start of a region or you can calculate offsets like these. And what I'm not showing here is we have a type system for this language which ensures that uh, a well-typed program cannot overwrite values, for example, or you do not return uninitialized blocks of memory, but I won't be covering that in my talk today. Uh, so uh, we do not uh, ask the programmers to write programs in this. We sort of have a compiler class, which automatically translates the source program into these ones. And this is based on unification. Uh, we unify uh, the types in the functions uh, to have these annotations. So after we do this, we'll have a valid code load program, but we still might have functions like write most or updates, which we want to fix. Uh, we can't compile them as it is. And to detect what functions uh, might be a problem, we use this thing called find reversals. Uh, and the basic idea is to know if every function inspects every byte of the back tree that it got, which basically translates to saying that does it process all the back inputs it got, and does the pattern match uh, values are used or not. So the add one example for it uh, does traverse the input because it's given one tree and it processes that, and both A and B are used in the tree. But right most, for example, it doesn't do that because it goes the left subtree here. So the output of this pass is going to be a function and uh, an annotation on the type. So this thing says that a map-like function add one, for example, traverses its input, and write most does not. And the idea is to fix functions which do not traverse their inputs. So this is where random access comes in. Uh, we, this was the thing that we saw. Uh, we can either fix such programs by adding random access or by generating dummy traversals, which sort of traverse those parts of the region. Uh, in general, this is specific to a data type. So if a function uh, requires random access for this data type, we just update this data type, and not any other data type. Uh, and if, if it has, so this thing has four values in it, which would be back, uh, which translates to it having three random access pointers that have random access for all of this. So this is a full random access version of a data type. Uh, so second thing is indirections. Uh, so <coughs> the unification algorithm uh, treats unification failures with calls to copy functions. So updates, for example, would have calls to copy functions, which basically say that copy <coughs> some part of the data structure here. Uh, this is a simple thing which we replace, uh, fix those failures with indirections. Uh, yeah, so that was the basic idea. Uh, let's see how fast it is. Uh, so we have two sorts of benchmarks. One is I/O intensive. Uh, I forgot to mention that when you have structures like these, you can write this to memory and you can just use them directly. Just reading this structure is just mmap. We don't have to pass anything. Uh, so first. Yeah, I'm going to get to that in a minute. <laughs> so this benchmark uh, loads Twitter data for a month and counts the hashtag cats in it. Uh, this is what this is what a tweet looks like. It has hashtags and a user ID, uh, and the data is structured. <coughs> for every line is a separate JSON object. Uh, this is the whole thing is not a JSON array. Uh, this one JSON object for like. Uh, and we compare it against these libraries. So rapid JSON is an efficient C++ library uh, which, which processes JSON data. And we have two versions for it. Uh, the first one is the parser version, which actually parses the JSON. And the next one is Lexer, which is lex less strict. And it just sort of goes through the tree and looks for the word cat. In it. It's similar, it's more like that, that it doesn't pass anything. Uh, for these sort of programs, oh. so we compare against CNF and Kappen Proto, and to process them, we have to 
pre-process the JSON data into their respective serialized formats. So for Captain Proto, we would we run a small script which converts the JSON data into their serialization format. And we do the same thing for CNF and for our compiler. And this is a slowdown chart. So the baseline is our compiler, which is here, and it processes 9 million tweets really fast in uh, 0.39 seconds. Uh, so the rapid JSON is uh, the parser version is way up here. It's way slower than our compiler. Uh, the Lexer version is a bit faster, uh, but it's still, it's, in the worst case, it's like uh, 11 times slower than this. And that's because it's processing raw JSON data. Uh, CNS performs well uh, on some smaller inputs, but as your data grows bigger, uh, the performance gets worse. What is CNF? Oh, sorry. CNF is a Haskell library uh, which allows you to use serialized regions in Haskell. So CNF would be, uh, you would write a GHC program and use CNF to allocate some part of your data to be serialized. So just to be sure, the input is fixed to be uh, JSON? Uh, for CNF and Captain Proto, it's not. Uh, because they have their own serialization formats, we <coughs> pre-process the JSON file into their expected serialization format. But then you're running the risk of comparing apples with oranges, aren't you? Um, so this, this, the point of this benchmark is to show that uh, is to show that serialization does help here. Uh, so processing data, serializing data directly is good, and you do get speed up from this. Does does the uh, graph for CNF and Kemper, does it include the translation? It does not. No. No. Why the the so we're, the random JSON JSON and, and the Yeah, the random no. JSON ones are sort of for, for scan. The the three serialized ones are all just focusing on their chosen serialization. Just that Thank you. Do you compare this against the binary J JSON format or something? Uh, I do not have numbers for it. No. Uh, okay. I don't have numbers for it. No. So, Captain Proto is slightly worse than CNF in some cases. Uh, so, we have another similar benchmark. Wait. Oh, yeah. Just a quick question. Most of these show a similar shape here. Can you tell us what's going on? It's like cache effects happening here. Why do these all have a similar shape? So, that's what. So, I do not have. I'm not 100% sure what's happening, but for similar data types, uh, using serialization does not uh, help that much because when you have a smaller data set, uh, you don't get that much uh, performance optimization. Could it also be that uh, your system gets slower when it gets those, so it gets closer to their the performance of the others? Oh, yeah. Over here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yours is like has a curve like this. Right. And then the layers are all look like that because you're now got closer to the performance. Yeah. That's that's possible. It's good to be, yeah. Wait, so you didn't match the uh the CNF that we're supposed to. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is another benchmark which uh where we have ASP nodes for from few bracket libraries, and we store their S expression format on this, and we iterate through them to count the number of nodes in it. Uh, so here, the bracket is way up here, which is quite expected. Uh, this is a regular C program, which is using pointers, and this is the one using C as representation. So this graph is not, so this is where your point function, uh, it's an apple storage orange comparison. But even if you do discount the serialized thing, uh, racket is still six, point, six times slower because it's using an inefficient representation. Well, it's, also, it's also a very slow system. Yes. So, yes. Yeah. You're, you're, you're not compiling the racket. No. Uh, so you are not comparing. So this is, this is even the student. So this is the C program which is using. No, no, but what, what comes out of your code generator? Oh, uh, C programs. Right. So, uh, so you should generate, you should write it back in. 
So what we do is we run each benchmark nine times so that uh, the when you run it enough times, the assumption is that the kernel would ensure that the data is uh, in cache. Right. What drop the worst performance? We take an uh, we take an average. Uh, we take a mean of uh, with a, of all the runs, which should have gone. But. If, if the various algorithms access that data in different orders, that's going to really confuse caching algorithms for those so, things. This is one of the advantages of using this, that we using this guarantees you a linear memory access factor. Right, for your Which, library, but not yeah. for others. So that, that, is, that is one uh, disadvantage that they have, is what I would argue. That yeah. So when you ran these tests, you, you reboot the computer between running the tests. Oh, um, no. Right. It, so my point is that if you ran, depending on what order you ran these tests in, the file could have been cached in a different order based on which algorithm you ran first, because your one guarantees linear, but the others don't. Oh, but if you run this, uh, so what I would say is if you run this enough times, a week, so we not, if you run this enough times, it should be in cache for every single run. Yeah, it will be in cache, I agree with you there, but it's cache locality in the order that it's in the cache. Uh -huh. So if you ran your algorithm first, you'd expect it to be loaded into the cache completely in order. Uh -huh. But if I ran a different algorithm first, I'd expect it to have loaded stuff into a cache in, in a different kind of order. So if we, uh, we run each one in sequence nine times, and then run the next algorithm nine times per hour. Oh, that really does confuse things. <laughs> I have no idea how you'd even reason about that. And it's it's this is just it's trying to get a, a rough approximation of how long it takes to get an algorithm. So uh, for for the paper we used uh, criteria in Haskell, which is a little better. Okay. Did you, did you do anything with looking at performance counters or cache uh, time or something like that to actually look at memory to account for memory accesses or to try to count memory accesses? Uh, we have not looked at that. Robust way. Uh -huh. Yeah, we'll keep that in mind. Just to be sure, you processing 20 gigabit per second. Is that right? The earlier benchmark? Yes. It's, you, no, no, no. Just the numbers there. It was 366 megabyte, and you're doing it in 0.13 seconds, so it's about 200 gigabit per second. Uh, sure, yeah, these numbers, yeah. yeah. Wow, that's, I don't know what kind of system you use, but that seems like, you know, that's as fast as I hope. So this was a huge uh, system which had like uh, 30 codes and a huge amount of time. Yeah. But this, you assume that's an extra in that part. You assume a cache part, right? 
then for then for you like say it's not uh, you could read you could read it faster if you just did a new copy. So we have like, we have a few numbers for in memory programs. So these were sort of uh, taking advantage of the fact that we are not deserializing anything. Uh, these programs just process, uh, just create a big tree in memory and then process it. Uh, so this is a simple tree example. Uh, functions using the tree data type uh, So the most key packed version here is the one which uses those pointers. Uh, the fully packed version is compiled to just copy or traverse it whenever required. Uh, this is just regular C programs using pointers. And this is CNF, the GHC library, and this is Captain Throttle. <coughs> and the red things here are is the fastest benchmark, uh, fastest program for that benchmark. So, for example, for the identity function, this GCC turns out to be the fastest thing. Uh, so, if you look at these numbers, you should get a feel for it that serialization does optimize your program, even if you're not processing any external data. So this was the rightmost example that we saw, which were using those indirection pointers. Uh, GCC beats that, but it's still faster than most of the other implementations. So Parker, we were going to program that say swaps to the left and the right subtrees. Uh -huh. And so we did that in the first walk over the tree. Yeah. Uh, every node swapping the left and the right subtrees, mm -hmm. or swapping the swap you know, the person process. Right. What would we end up so are you so are you trying to get to the point that what happens if after the fact uh, if we process a tree with those pointers is that what you well I'm just uh, I'm, I'm imagining you take that data type you've written you mm -hmm. have five no data type in the recursive case you know you have f of left and right yeah and you call f on left call f on right mm -hmm. and take the results and put swap them and build them in node right. and, and that's what you return. So, so it's, a, it's a map yeah. from, one, from a tree to a tree, mm -hmm. but everything will be swapped. So if, 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 the function, if, if, if the function writes new trees always, like add one, but uh, you wouldn't say that in the add one case, you would write the right subtree before the left subtree. In that case, the representation would be just as efficient as it would. Because it would end up with, uh, the function is rewriting the whole uh, buffer anyways. So changing the order in that case does not affect. So the path that logical case is easy to imagine. If you start with an empty binary tree, you can things Right. You have no then, idea. then you'll converge on just the binary based representation. So, so if you're actually the compiler, the good job when it has traversal in it. Yeah, the the, the traversal uh, effect of prints can sort of figure out in a, in a simple case where you are consuming the whole tree, but it's sort of a weird order. Of yeah, I'm not, it's not so much considering the whole tree, it's constructing a new tree. Yeah, yes. It's a, a sort of scramble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I, I, uh, we, we can run that to figure out what would happen, but I, yeah. I believe there it would, it would not try to do share it. Yeah. So if, if you're just traversing in a, a tree down these pointers when you need to, uh, I wonder whether you've, have you tried to evaluate how much the CPU's uh, indirection prediction is making a difference there? Uh, I, I have not tried to run that, but we have a benchmark which compares traversing those pointers. Okay. So this is, I just have one minute I think, or I'm already out of time. Uh, but this is, uh, so composing, uh, this is an example which composes those two things. So in here, uh, fine max uh, is an incomplete traversal and it's going to use those pointers. And propagate constant is a function which sort of processes the whole tree. Uh, so you, if you look at the time here, uh, and sorry, the rep max uh, sort of is a composition of those two things. So if you use fine max on a tree, the result is going to contain pointers, and you are sort of iterating that in propagate const. So you can see the time difference here. So if you run just propagate const, uh, it's way faster than running it on a pointer based uh, on a representation with pointers. 
So there's a difference between this 0.43 seconds and 0.48 seconds, and it's not five miles. Uh, that's really fast. So this does slow down programs, but it's faster than everything else. Can you say again what is mostly packed? So yeah, mostly packed is uh, a version which would use those pointers when required, uh, those indirections and random access nodes. And fully packed version just copies or traverses things whenever required. So I think I'm out of time. Uh, but thank you.